Amen. Are you there? Shout amen. amen. See, that's an easy book to find. We're going to be in the 23rd verse. And uh, you can follow along. I have, a, I have a decent amount of scripture that you can just jot some notes down. I'm not going to have you turn everywhere, but this is the main meat of what we're going to be covering today. And I'm going to do my best. I'm going to do my very best to convey the message that the Lord is speaking into my heart to you because I believe it's going to help you here in this time that we're living in right now. So if you're ready, shout amen. amen. Let's go. Verse 23 says this, then Jesus got into the boat and started across the lake with his disciples. So Jesus performed an action. He got in the boat. See, if you, if you, most people know this story. If you've been, uh, if you've been a Christian for a while, or if you've been attending church, you've probably heard this preached in 7,000 different ways. But I want to tell you that Jesus will always do what he says he's going to do. You see, a few verses before he told his disciples, we're going to the other side of the lake. We're going to the other side, right? Go get in the boat. And then he talked to some people, and then it says here in verse 23 that he got in the boat, and they started across the lake with his disciples. And the Bible says in verse 24, suddenly a fierce storm struck the lake. Suddenly all heck broke loose. The wind and the waves, they were breaking into the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. I want you to catch this, that Jesus was asleep. Jesus wasn't worried. Jesus wasn't fretting. Jesus, Jesus knew that he needed some rest before he got to where he was going. Jesus was not affected by the surroundings of where he was. Are you catching what I'm throwing at you? That we don't have to be worried about the surroundings. We don't have to be, we are in this world, but we are not of this world. This world cannot affect me in the way that it used to be able to affect me. I can affect the world in a way that, that the world could never affect me because I have something inside of me that's far greater than treasure. It's far greater than riches and gold and all the things the world could give me. And that, that is the name and that is the glory and the power of Jesus Christ. That's who's living inside of me. And that's what God wants us to give away to somebody. That's the mission, right? So it says that he was sleeping in the boat. And verse 25, the disciples went and woke him up shouting. Have you ever had to wake someone up in a frantic mess? Have you? You shake, hey, hey we're going to die, right? They shook Jesus shouting, saying, Lord Jesus, save us. We're going to drown. The boat wasn't sinking. The waves were crashing. The boat wasn't going under, but in their minds, they perceived what? That they were going to drown, that they were going to die, that this was the worst situation of all situations, that this was the one, this is the final moments. We're in the final countdown. This is it. We're done. Catch what Jesus was doing when they woke him up. He was sleeping. He wasn't worried. He wasn't fretting. He wasn't looking around saying, this is the worst that it's ever been. Man, this is terrible. Listen, I, I believe that it's not going to get better, but our perspective has to change because we're not done working yet. There's still a mission that needs to be done. There's still, there's still work that needs to be done, church. You can't get comfortable and lazy. You can't walk away from what God is pointing you towards because there's a little storm that's hitting your boat. You can't allow the, the waves and the wind and all those things to overcome the power and the authority that Christ has placed in you because there's something greater on the other side. Say there's something greater on the other side. So Jesus responded in verse 26, why are you afraid? Does your, does your Bible have red letters? These are the words of Jesus. Jesus said, why are you afraid? question mark, right? And then he says these words to his, to his disciples. This isn't to the world. This is to his disciples. You have so little faith, exclamation mark. Jesus didn't rebuke them for being afraid. He rebuked them for not having faith. How many people in this very building need to be rebuked because their faith is little? 
Ouch. Amen. Sometimes we see all the stuff going on around us. We experience it and, and our emotions take over and we forget who lives on the inside of us. Who's in this boat? Who's asleep in this boat? Whose peace is in this boat? We forget that when the waves are crashing into us and that we're getting knocked down, that, that when we're on our knees, we're our strongest. We forget that sometimes. We forget to look around and say, God, even in the terrible moments of our life, you're still God. Even whenever, whenever all hell is breaking loose around us, even whenever we can't see the shoreline, we can't see the sunshine, we can't see any of that, that Jesus is still on the throne, that he's still actively pursuing us, that he's still making a way through the, through the desert, he's still making a way through the storm, he's still making a way through the waves. He's allowing us to walk on the water. We don't see it with our natural eyes. But here's the thing I want you to get today. I want you to know this through and through that we're not to look at this world with our natural eyes. God has not called us to look at it from a place of mankind, from human strength and human understanding. You are called to look at it through spiritual eyes. You're called to look at your job, the person that, that, that you dislike, the person that, 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 that says bad things about you, the, the stranger on the street, the, 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 the leaders that are in control right now, the, 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 the uncertainty in our world. You're not supposed to be looking at that with your natural eyes. You're supposed to be looking at that through the lens of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even your worst enemy deserves Christ. Even the person that cuts you off in traffic deserves Christ. They need Christ more than ever. They cut you off in traffic. Even the person that said bad things about you on the internet deserves Christ. They need to know the love of Christ because Christ's love can cause you to forgive people that don't deserve to be forgiven. The love of Christ can cause you to grow up in a way that you will not fall into the temptation to be a petty, hear me, a petty person because we are above that influence because pettiness is of the world and Jesus came to die for all. His love trumps all. His love embraces all. Catch that. His love I'm not talking about your love. I'm talking about his love. But if you have him, that should be your love. That should be the way that we respond and we act. But Jesus rebuked his disciples for having such little faith. Now, see, little faith is a faith that lacks confidence. It's a faith that trusts too little, right? It can also be, de it can also be described as underdeveloped faith. You see, in Romans 10, 17, it says this, so faith comes from hearing. What comes from hearing? Faith. faith comes from hearing. And that is hearing the good news about Jesus Christ. Our faith has to be developed. You see, we can have little faith. And, and I laugh when I read this story because these are the disciples. If you go back and read uh, chapter 7, you read chapter 6, you, you read all of Matthew, you're going to find that Jesus wasn't just performing miracles. He was performing some major miracles. People with leprosy being healed. People, people being delivered from, from iniquity and, and, and demonic possession. People, people being transformed, their lives being changed for it. This is not like, you know, hey, you had a cold, don't have a cold no more. We're talking about people that were, that were despised for the, the ailment that they had on their life. They were, they were alienated, ostracized because of the way that they were. If you were a leper in those days, no one wanted anything to do with you. You were considered unclean. Get out of here. You had to be clear on the other side of the street. They put you in colonies. Like it was nasty, terrible. Your life was ruined. And Jesus said, be whole. Jesus performed those miracles, right? And, the, and the, who was there with them? The disciples. The disciples saw with their eyes, they experienced it with their life, but yet they're in this moment where the wind and the waves are crashing up against the boat and they forgot. How many of us forget sometimes of the things that God's brought us through? We, we get into those moments where the wind and the waves are crashing up against our boat and we just think to ourselves, Lord, how could you have left me? How could you have forgotten about me? 
and you forget the 7,000, 700,000, 777,000 times, million times that God has pulled you out of the mess. You forget about the, the job opportunities and the family and the, the love and the, 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 the resources and the things that he's placed. And you forget that he pulled you out of misery and put your feet upon his name. You forget that. We forget that as people. Why? Because that's how the enemy wants us to live. He wants us to live in a place where we don't give God his glory. We don't give God his honor. We forget how to worship him in the moment because if he can get our mouths to be silent, then he has us. You see, but you're here to say something today. You're here to say something today. In your life, you need to be able to speak effectively. In the world that we live, you need to be able to speak effectively. You have to say something. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. Right? It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Faith doesn't mean that we always see the outcome. It's the evidence of what we're hoping for. Lord, I believe that you can do it. I know, I've seen it done before. I know, God, that you will do it again. I know that it will happen in your will and in your way and in your timing. I trust you, God. Even though I don't feel like it, Lord, I still trust you. Even though I can't see joy at the other end of it, I still trust you. I know, God, that your best is before me. That, that even whenever misery is in your life, that he's still blessing you. Can you see that, church? Can you understand that? Can you comprehend that with your mind? That even whenever you're in the midst of the trial, that your God loves you. That your, your Father, Jesus Christ, cares for you. He's there beside you. It says that he walks with us. And, and I love, I love that, old, uh, that old poem, the uh, footprints in the sand, because in those times when you only see the one set of footprints, those are the moments that Jesus is carrying you. Can I be honest with you? Jesus carries me more often than I walk on my own. And you know what? That's beauty. It's beautiful. It's beautiful to know that whenever I'm tired and I'm weary and I'm weak, that Holy Spirit partners with me and Jesus comes and scoops me up in his arms I remember, oh man, I remember, I remember when, uh, I remember when Maddie was, a, was a little, little kid. Maddie's my sister. I, I speak Jesus. Uh, I speak Jesus. Yes. So, uh, I remember when Maddie was a little girl and, uh, you know, I used to torture her cause you know, that's what big brothers do. I mean, we torture our little sisters. That's what we do. Ask, ask any of my siblings. They all got tortured. Uh, <laughs> because I'm like 92 and they're like 12. Uh, it was a weird thing. <clears throat> but I remember when she was a little girl, and, uh, you know, little girls, they always fall, they fall down sometimes. And, you know, just those, those stub toes and those busted kneecaps, and, and, you know, it's like they start crying and you scoop them up, right? And you pull them close to you, and it's like the warmest, safest feeling. You know what I'm talking about? You know, parents in the room, whenever your kid, whenever your kid falls down and you, you reach over and you, you scoop them up and you pull them into your arms and you carry them around. Sometimes, you know, uh, when they're crying and they can't be soothed, just, just picking them up and holding them in your arms. It's that feeling of safety, that feeling of security, right? And you just, you walk around and you sing over them and you pray over them guess what? Your father does that for you too. When he sees you hurting, he comes in and he scoops you up and he wraps his arms around you and he sings over you. This is my child. This is my blessing. This is my anointed one. This is my son. This is my daughter. He sings those words. This is, this is the head and not the tail. That even though the circumstances seem dire, that your dad's right here with you, that I'm holding you, that I'm comforting you. He's rubbing your back. His tears are falling on you. He sings over us. He worships and prays and, 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 and declares his goodness over us as a good father should. Hmm. 
I don't know if you're encouraged by that, but I am. But it's not just the things that we can see with our eyes. It's the things that we hope for. So what is the storm? What is the mountain? What is the obstacle in your life? What is, it, what is it that you're looking at right now? Is it loneliness? Is it the loss of a job? Diagnosis? A disease? A wounded relationship? Is it trouble in your home? Is it something that I haven't mentioned? Is it a lost loved one? A nasty coworker? What is the mountain that is in front of you right? What is the storm that is in front of you right now? The obstacle that the enemy is using to keep you from where you're going. Because that's the thing here. These obstacles aren't just to cause us to be burdened. It's to cause us to not get to the place that God wants us to be. There's always a destination. Amen? We're not there yet. We're, we're working on getting there. We want to get to that destination. But if we don't persevere through these things, the enemy can keep us where we are and we won't get to that place where God wants to receive the honor and the glory. Matthew 21, 21 says this, then Jesus told them, I tell you the truth. If you have what? 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 Faith. Come on, if you have what? Faith. If you have what? Faith. I think I got you all on that one. If you have faith, right? If you have faith and don't doubt, you can do these things and so much more. This is Jesus talking to his disciples again. He says, you can say to the mountain. What can you do? You can say. You can use this. You see, we're really good at using this on, on, uh, on earthly things. We're really good at exercising our, our right to speak whenever we feel we've been slighted or wronged. We're real good to stand up for ourselves whenever we feel that injustice has been wrongly placed on us. Whenever we don't agree with the narrative that's around us, it's easy for us to spew our opinion. But this isn't what Jesus is talking about saying. He's, he's talking about in faith speaking to those obstacles See, you can replace mountain with storm. You can, play, you can replace mountain with uh, broken relationship, broken home, displaced parents, sick parent, sick child. You can replace mountain with a lot of things. Loss of a job. You can replace mountain with so many things. But it doesn't change the fact that we have to speak. Right? We have to speak to those mountains. And what happens? You can say that it can be lifted up and thrown into the sea. And Jesus said these words, and it will happen. But we have to believe. We have to have faith, right? When we look at the world around us and we see the disaster that is the world that we live in, because we can, we can classify it as that. It's a disaster right now. It's wars. It's rumors of wars. It's poor leadership. It's, it's division on a, on a, a massive scale. It's brother against brother, it's mother against son, it's, it's family against family. There's a identity crisis in the world that we're living in right now, especially in America, where we can't determine who we are anymore. So we'll just be whatever we want to be. Today, I'm a taco. Tomorrow, I'll be a toaster. We, you laugh, you laugh, but this is the world that we're living in where everything is upside down and it's, and it's flipped around. It doesn't make any sense. When you look at it with your rational mind, you look at it and you say, God, this just doesn't make sense. And he says, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. That's what he's saying. In the last days, there is an opportunity. There's a mandate to speak. Yeah. Prophesy. There is a mandate to, to use what God has placed within you and to allow it to come out of here. And it's not the way that you feel and it's not your opinion, but it is thus saith the word of God. It is, it is the word that will sustain us. It is the word that will cause us to be able to fight effectively. It is the word that is going to cause your friends and your loved ones and the people you care about and the strangers on the street to know Christ Jesus because you're going to plant seeds of hope in a hopeless situation. When was the last time you told someone about Jesus? 
You don't have to answer that. It's a rhetorical question. When was the last time that you took time to share your faith with somebody else? When was the last time that you said the name Jesus to somebody? Or you thank God in the presence of somebody? That's planting a seed, people. That when they look at your mess and they look at your dysfunction and you can say these words, I trust God. I know that he has my best in mind. I know that in the face of all this uncertainty, that if I put my trust in him, that he's going to direct my path, that he's going to establish me, that he decrees life over me, that he says to me, this day I shall live and not die, that he says that, that today I shall have peace, that today I shall have hope because I don't lean on the world. I lean on the giver of peace and hope, and his name is Jesus. When was the last time? We have to be able to declare those things from our lips. It's not good enough that we just come to church. Praise God you're here. I'm glad you're here. It's not good enough that we just uh, attend a church or we come to Wednesday Night Discipleship. If you're not coming to Wednesday Night Discipleship, shame on you. Get to Wednesday Night Discipleship. That's your rebuke. That's your rebuke. Come. Come. Get into the fellowship of other believers. Come and learn what God's word says. Come and be part of the community because that is where your strength comes from. It comes from being connected to God and connected to people. Amen. Get your kids educated. Get your kids anointed. Get your kids ready for the fight that is ahead of them. I feel so bad for the generation that's coming up because they are facing hell on a, on a crazy level. A crazy, us adults, we get to go to work and deal with people and they, they have to deal with all of this stuff and, and they're not equipped for the fight. It's like, it's like telling them that they're about to fight Mike Tyson, getting them into some shorts, putting them in the gloves, but not giving them any training. Mike Tyson's going to destroy them. He's going to knock them down. He's going to beat them up. You want your kids to be strong. That's why you have to start by giving them the word. You have to plant it in them. And if you have trouble with that, get them, get them to Wednesday night discipleship. Our people will help them to know what it means to go into battle prepared with a sharp sword, ready to fight. Because that's important. But adults, you need to know how to fight too. And this is, feels like a weird shameless plug for Wednesday nights, but I'm going to do it anyways. Like, it's important for us to be in fellowship with each other, not just on Sundays. You don't get to greet people like you would on a Wednesday. You don't get to be in fellowship and community on a, on a Sunday morning. It's hectic. You come in here, you're sliding in the parking lot sideways, full, pulling the emergency brake, grabbing your kids by the hair, bringing them. In. You're showing up 15 minutes late. So you, there, you didn't get to greet nobody because you got to go through kid check and you got to do all that and get them in. And then you're running in like two and a half songs into the, into the worship service. And, you know, I'm saying it funny, but it's, it's the truth. Sundays are hectic. Whoever wrote that song easy like a Sunday morning was not a believer. <laughs> so there ain't nothing easy about a Sunday morning. Right? <laughs> I know I get you there, right? But it's important for us to be in fellowship with each other. It's important for us to be in community because that's how we grow. That's how we learn. That's, that's how we get strength. Because if I, see, if I see my brother going through something and his response is, is, is anointed and, and it's covered in, in, in the blood of Christ, then whenever that season comes to my life, I can respond the same way. Right? The Bible says that one can put 1,000 to flight, two can put 10,000 to flight. You know, those, you know this scripture, right? It's saying that we're better together, right? So back to the story of, of Jesus in the boat with his disciples. How many disciples were in the boat with him? Do you know that? 11. So he had 11 of his disciples in the boat with him that had experienced and seen so many good things that God had done, but yet they're afraid. They have fear in their heart because of the situation around them. And Jesus says, you have little faith. Then he got up, right? And the Bible says that he rebuked the wind and the waves. And suddenly there was a great what? 
Jesus spoke, and the chaos was calm, right? Now, here's how I think most of us would have responded in this moment. Verse 27 says, the disciples were amazed. What? Who is this man? They asked. The guy that they had seen perform so many miracles. It's, it blows my mind. Like, there is some comedy in the Bible. You know, it's, there's some serious stuff. When, if, but if you read this in the context that I'm thinking, it's, it's hilarious. It's like, what do you mean? Like, you've seen him do crazier things than just saying, hey, when? Shut up. Right? Be still. Calm. Try saying be still to a toddler. They're working on it over there today, I promise. Even the winds and the waves obey him. Right? Even the, not just sickness and infirmity, not just, not just demons, but the wind and the, every aspect of the human condition, every aspect of nature, every aspect of, uh, of, of the natural order of the way that the world is, listens, hear me, listens to what Jesus speaks. But can I tell you this, that, that the, the word declares that Jesus said these words, you will do greater things in my name. And we forget that because if Jesus can look at the storm that is around him and say, be still, and the storm listens, then why is it that whenever we're in the storms of our life that we don't have the voice, we don't have the faith that, that we need to say, in the name of Jesus Christ, be still. And watch what happens. It's not just lip service. It's not just something that we're saying. We're believing it. It's faith. We got to have big faith, not little faith. You see, little faith is a faith that lacks confidence and trusts too little. It's, it's underdeveloped faith. I think Pastor said it, said it best uh, multiple weeks ago. He said, you know, you, you got to get off the milk. He said it differently, but I'm not going to say that because, <laughs> you know, that's, that's his thing. <laughs> you you got to get off the milk and you got to get into the meat you got to stop waiting for someone to spoon feed it to you. Because guess what? You're not an invalid. You're, you're, not, you're not crippled. You have the ability to come up to the table and sit down and sup with him. You, have the ta you could sit down and eat with your Savior right now. You have that ability. It's not about coming to church on Sunday and hearing a message. It's not about tuning into your favorite preacher online or watching YouTube videos throughout the week. Open the Bible. Get into it. Sow seeds of life and blessing into you. Because if you do that, then whenever these storms arise, you're going to have the ability. Listen to me. You're gonna, it's like going to the gym and lifting weights. When you first start, you can't lift that much. Right? Right? Because why? Because your muscles are weak. But if you hold to the regimen, if you hold to the schedule and you keep going and you keep increasing and you keep increasing and you keep increasing, then whenever you get to the gym after 30, 60, 90, 100 days, right? You lift way more at 100 days than you did on day one. Why? Because your muscles are developed. They're stronger. You're able to hold more weight. Hear me. You're able to hold more weight. Not that you want to hold more weight, but when the weight comes, you won't crumble. You won't. Oh, hey. There's not an electrical outlet there. We didn't see that. Just put that right there. <laughs> Don't tell pastor. <laughs> Let me just put that down there. Uh, but we, we won't, it's not that we, we won't cr crumble under the weight. We'll be strong enough to overcome those things. So when we get into his word, we, we actually gain muscle mass. And I'm not talking in the physical, I'm talking in the spiritual. We become spiritual muscle men and women. You can crush the head of your enemy. That's the word right there. 
you can crush. When was the last time you, in authority, crushed the head of your enemy? You see, the problem is we don't crush the head of our enemy. We say, man, he is just so powerful. I'm so tired. Oh, man. He's just been beating me up. And we become so weak because we're so malnutritioned. We're, 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 we're depending on being able to crush the head of our enemy, being on the milk when we need to be in the meat. That's where the crushing comes from. That's whenever... That's whenever the crushing happens because we need to stomp out the attacks of our enemy. You know why? Because there's someone in your life right now. There's, oh, I feel Holy Spirit all over. There. There's someone in your life right now that needs to know the Jesus that you serve and you've been a bad steward of showing them who Jesus is. You've been walking around stomping the head of your enemy, and the enemy's like, oh, I feel a little tickle. Oh, what was it? Did some, is it raining? No, 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 no. The world, the people in your life need to see you in action, stomping the head of your enemy, crushing his head, not just, not just tickling him, we're, we're destroying the works of the enemy. We're destroying the assignment that the enemy has put out there. We're standing in the authority knowing that Christ Jesus is for us. And if he's for us, who can be against us? We're not just looking at the world and saying the world is a mess. We're saying, what can I do to bring one with me? We're stomping the head of our enemy. We're declaring today, because we're not going to be silent, we're declaring today that stomping... We're declaring that, that crushing is what produces the faith that we need in our lives. Turn to your neighbor and say these words. I can crush the enemy. You know why? Because of Christ Jesus. Because of Christ Jesus. It's all because of him. It's all because of him. Thank you, Jesus. You see, Jesus shows the way to remove the mountains, the obstacles. Jesus shows us exactly what it means to use our mouths. Listen, in Psalms 19, 14, it says this, and this, is a, this could be a prayer. This could be something that you pray over your life, and it says this, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. When was the last time you just glorified the name of the Father? Oh, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O oh Lord. When I, when I meet those people today, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart not be on my circumstance. May it not be on my surroundings. May it not be in my own strength, but may it be met with your love and your mercy and your compassion because you are the rock and the redeemer. You are the one that I'm standing on and I'm not walking into this blindsided by what, what the situation is, but I have the understanding, I know in my heart that you said if you're for me, then who can be against me? We are living in the last days, people. I, I, I believe this fully with my heart. We're, we're, we're living in the last days. These are the last times that we have to get ready for his return. There is a mandate, there is a mission, there is a purpose to your life. You're not just here randomly. You're not just part of the team because you needed, we needed an extra player. That's not what this is. There's no time to be on the bench. There's no time to get on the sideline. You have to get on the field. And a lot of us have been seated in comfy places for too long. 
We've been sitting on the sideline watching other people do it for so long that we've, we got paralysis. Our legs shake when we try to stand up for ourselves. We look like a little baby deer after it's been born and we're just trying to walk through life. But you've got to strengthen those legs. You've got to get them strong. Why? Because there's some devil stomping to be done. There's some devil stomping to be done. And if you don't have strong legs, it's because you've been on the sideline too long. So this is your encouragement to stand up, get up, get out of those comfortable places. Refuse to be comfortable because when we're comfortable, that's when we're killable. The reason you're getting killed right now is because you're comfortable. I'm being, I'm being honest with you. The reason that the enemy is fighting you so bad right now is because you're comfortable. And he doesn't want you to, to understand what's inside of you. He, does, he doesn't want you to fully comprehend what's, what's living on the inside of you. Right? Come on, team. He doesn't, he doesn't want you to know that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Right? He doesn't want you to know that. Why? Why? Because time's not on our side. He's one day closer today than he was yesterday. Tomorrow, Lord willing, we're still here. He'll be one day closer than he was today. Today's a good day. You know why? Because you have purpose. Today's a good day. Why? Because you have intentionality. Today's a good day. Why? Because you have Christ Jesus living on the inside of you. Today's a good day. Why? Because we can declare his goodness and his mercy, and we should be declaring his goodness and mercy to all that will listen to us. Running into that burning building to save one more person because it's the mission, it's the goal, it's the purpose of why you were placed here on planet earth. It wasn't to be a good husband, a good wife, a good son, a good daughter. Those are all great things to aspire to. It wasn't to be good at your job, good at what you put your hand to. That's part of living this life, but it is not why you are here. You are here, son and daughter, to tell someone about your Savior. You're here today to spread the gospel message far and wide into places that no one in your vicinity can do it because you were planted in this moment. You were planted, Judah, in this moment to be a voice for the lost, to bring in souls. Church, you were planted in this moment and this moment will reflect eternity you're planted in this moment today to, to declare with your mouth to decree with your mouth that Christ is Lord that there's only one way to get to the Father and that's through Jesus Christ that there's no more hey there's just be a good person no 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 you can be a good person all you want and go straight to hell today's the day of salvation today's the day to speak the day of Jesus because when you speak the name of Jesus that's when darkness has to flee that's when demons have to run that's when storms cease that's when problems uh, problems uh, just disappear we stand in the authority knowing I have one scripture that I want to read to you before before I close this thing down and it says this in Ecclesiastes 3 7 that, that there's a time to tear and a time to mend I read that as there's a time to fight and there's a time to not fight. But the second part is my favorite. There's a time to be quiet and there's a time to speak. The days of being quiet are over, Covenant Church. The days of being quiet, body of Christ are over. We don't have the luxury in these last moments that we have on planet earth not to share the gospel with somebody. You're sitting there today and you're, you're charged and ready to go into the world. The Lord has empowered us in this moment. He, he's given us this day to go into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come. Come where? Come to Covenant Church? Sure, you could do that, but you better be compelling them to come to Christ because Christ is more important than the church. And I'll echo what Pastor Josh said uh, a couple weeks ago that the church is the only 
something behind four walls that is being silent. We're the only thing that's sitting in our comfortable sanctuary being silent about what's happening all around us. Hell is, is unleashed on the earth. The building is on fire. The building is crumbling and falling down around us. And all we care about is, Lord, I want to make it to heaven. But the Lord says, if you come to heaven empty-handed, then you will come to heaven disappointed. I'm passionate about this because we are in a moment in history, we are in a moment in time right now when your sons and daughters need to know Christ. The people that you surround yourself with need to know Christ. They don't need to know what religion is. I don't care about religion. I don't care if they come to this church. I don't care if they, if they put money in a plate or tie. All those things will happen naturally. The Lord will send the Holy Spirit to give them the heart to want to do those things. Right now they need to know that the love of the Father looks past their ugliness. The love of the Father looks past their sinfulness. The love of the Father doesn't look at the outward appearance, but he looks at the inward man. He sees what they shall become, not what they are, that, that he understands that we are in the process of being built and made into the church that God wants us to be.